Thanks for coming today. This is the primer on how organizations are using clean rooms on Databricks to use uh, to collaboration to fuels insights and outcomes from BI to ML and beyond. Hey, I'm Anil Pulieran. I'm a senior architect at Habu. Um, I have been at Habu for close to two years and in the industry for close to 15 years. And my name is Matt Karasik. I am lucky enough to lead the product team at Habu. Uh, I've been in the industry using uh, data to make marketing work better for 20 plus years. I'll leave out how much the plus is. Um, Habu is a software company that makes, makes this data collaboration stuff easy, simple, safe, scalable, and smart. And so, if you're here, you may have heard of or already interacted with this notion of data collaboration and data clean rooms. It's gotten a ton of hype in the last couple of years, uh, and, and with good reason, and we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, but still, people are often asking, you know, what, what does it mean uh, to do safe data collaboration? What, what does that mean? What are these technical guarantees that clean rooms provide? Uh, and and it comes down to this. If you and your partners just have a, a mutually beneficial use case that involves commingling each other's data, models, or code. Habu uses clean rooms to allow, gives you the tooling to have you and your partners do this in plain sight with full transparency and control in a privacy safe way. That means your data gets to stay with you and be your data, their data is theirs, your models are yours, their models are theirs. And those use cases you agreed upon can execute, and only those things can execute in a privacy safe way. And that, that's what clean rooms provide. And so data collaboration's been happening for decades now. And so what is all this hype? Why, why clean rooms? Why this new, new approach to doing things? And it's due to a uh, set of market forces that are going on out there. First is consumer actions, right? Consumers don't like to be tracked unnecessarily. They, they don't want their data getting uh, thrown all over the place. And so they do things. They implement uh, ad blockers. They click the do not track button. Uh, in kind, browsers and operating systems start to put in these controls based on that consumer demand, making it so that the, some of the historical practices of how people would do data collaboration and share go away. Governments are coming in and saying, you know, putting in legislation and regulations saying what is allowed and what is not allowed. And as a result, some of the largest platforms on the planet with some of the most amount of data on the planet have closed their ecosystems and, and really created walls around them such that no, no data can come out. Clean rooms are the vehicle to do, do that data collaboration in, uh, in a future-proofed way, where instead of everyone having to centralize data to send each other big, huge amounts of data in log files or give each other access directly to source data, to put up you know, many, many one-by-one -one pixels in JavaScript on web pages and web apps, instead, the approach using clean rooms is for the software to come to where data is and leave it decentralized. So that if you and your partner, no matter what cloud platform or region they're on, want to collaborate, you're able to come into a clean room, architect and, and author what that use case is, and then have that be executed without having to centralize or share the raw underlying assets below it, all with the full controls to, to enforce consumer privacy, consumer sentiment. And, and why does this matter? I mean, you know, listen, why, why are we all here at, at a Databricks conference, right? Data, you know, the amount of data is only increasing. What people can do with data is only increasing. The skill sets are only increasing. And so those market forces cutting off access to data, you know, does not lower the, the appetite to use the most important data to, to generate these insights and outcomes, which is down to user level, down to event level data without then having to centralize it and, and ship it everywhere. And so if I could leave, if we could leave you understanding just one thing, it would be this. It's that in response to these market forces, 
technology has been, has been brought to market that does solve for these things in a future-proofed way. And so as a result, you now have access, unparalleled access to use data greater than you've ever had in a future-proofed way because these, these technology guarantees are, are in place. And so these, these break down into a few use cases. There's that internal set of data from another team, another product that is siloed, that has typically been ruled out. You can't get access to it. And it's almost always not because of what you're trying to do with it. It's because accessing it also opens the door to doing other things that aren't allowed. Clean Room solved for that, saying there is a way to implement this in a very simple, safe way without being able to open the doors to the other use cases that, that are not allowed. Defensive and reactive use cases, right? This is what we talked about um, a second ago, which is, you know, there's a whole bunch of industry use cases out there that used to centralize data. Let's put up a, a JavaScript tag over here. Let's ship a file over there. And so people are using cleanrooms to say, that's how I used to do things. How am I going to get access to that data now? And the answer is leave it where it is, connect to it at source, and do it with privacy and governance uh, in, in place. And the last one, and again, this is the one I, I highly recommend really making sure you walk away from this is, Savvy organizations are realizing that due to these technical guarantees that have, put in, that have been put in place in a reactive way due to some of those market forces, now have opened the door to being able to get access to data you never have before. So think, go back to your teams and think about what's that data set, what's that partner, what's that company that you've all long pined to be able to get access to that data, to just build that new model or get that new insight or unlock that new outcome where it's just been off the table. Again, not because the use case you had in mind that is problematic, but by just giving you access to the raw data was problematic because of what else you could do. And so I encourage you to, to go back and say, what is, what is that data that you've long wanted to get access to? Because the answer is you probably can get access to it now. Not to the actual source data, but to the use case that you wanted it to fuel behind the scenes. So Habu has been working with Databricks to come up with a new gen next generation of customer experiences for Clean Room. It helps with the openness and security that Databricks provides. It, it is merged with Habu to give you the best experience. There are three key aspects to a Clean Room that I can think of. The first is, who are the collaborators in the Clean Room? Who are the, who are the partners who are coming in into the Clean Room? which is represented here by the partner A, partner B, and partner C. They may all be using Delta tables in Databricks, or they may be using other clouds, they may have data in Azure, or maybe in S3 buckets, all of those. The second aspect that comes into a clean room is what do you want to bring into the clean room? When you bring into the clean room, you can bring in data sets, which, which is one of the things that you can bring in. You can bring in code. You may also want to bring in some models. All of this is supported in Habu. The third and the most important thing, I believe, is what comes out of it. What do you want to use a clean room for? It may be to build a new trained model. It may be for you to come up with aggregated results. Or you may even want to have some predictive results that you want to uh, get from the clean room. All of these is possible within Habu clean room. At this point, no, sorry. Uh, sorry. Yeah, the, at this point, all of these things are just a definition. This hasn't executed yet. So the next step is you go and run a question. Question is what we call this. When you run a question, Habu applies all the security and all the privacy policies that you have pre-configured and that Habu ha has internally. All of it is applied and it generates the output. Even the output can be chosen to be shared with all the partners or it may be just shared with a couple of them or it may be just uh, like you can look at it using BI tools within Habu. The next thing I want to talk to you guys about is the, the flexibility of the platform. You can probably imagine how technically hard it is to solve for both data and product teams as well as business teams. Both of them do interact with Habu, so we need to solve it for both of them. The data and product teams are usually looking for flexibility and configurability. They are trying to write uh, code in SQL, or they may want to write some Python code. 
They may want to bring in custom libraries. They may want to use existing libraries that are already there. All of these is possible in Habu. While the business teams are more looking for the output. Can they see aggregated results? Uh, are there prepackaged queries that they can choose? Are there overlap queries that they can run? Uh, can I get an automated report being sent to me, my email? All of these things are the things that business teams care more about. So let me try and uh, paint this picture with a, a couple of practical use cases uh, by, by industries. So let's just take re retail and consumer packaged goods, right? Retailers are the place where those CPG products are being sold, are being marketed, are being distributed. So it is in everybody's best interest for that company, that CPG company, to understand how their products are doing, which products I should send to this store, what promotions are working well, how am I competing in my category, what are these opportunities? Everybody wins if, if those types of things are solved. And so the key is really combining the data that these CPG companies had, the loyalty data they have about their customers, with some of the transaction data that those retailers have about what's getting sold, what's not getting sold. But again, that's an example where if that retailer were to just ship over all of the transactions from all of their stores to, to one of their brands, of course, there would be good things that happen and there'd be lots of really bad things that happen. First of all, that wouldn't be honoring the, the consumer privacy of both companies. Second of all, that would probably be anti-competitive to the other CPG companies in that same category. So this is a perfect example where these companies are now unlocked to be able to come into a clean room and be very, very deliberate and, and intentional about what the use cases are allowed and author them so that those and only those can execute without actually ever having to share the raw data, without that retailer having to ship all of that transaction data to their CPG customers. So they're able to come in there, get insights, build new models, create outcomes, run programs, wash, rinse, repeat. Health and life sciences, right? Same, same type of thing. Imagine a company who's looking to build a better cancer screening detection model. And so in order to do that, you need data from all over the ecosystem. You want you know, clinician data from providers. You want to understand um, uh, pharmaceutical data, which probably comes from payers. You want to combine that with real world data from, again, those retailers or, or other types of companies. And so the output that you're looking for is an aggregate trained model that's going to help keep people healthy without ever violating any single patient's actual identity or, or specific data. Again, that's where these companies are able to come in not move their data, but connect to it at its source, no matter what that source is, no matter the cloud, the platform, or the region, and author that use case and then be able to execute that. Travel and entertainment, that category has long been, you know, just fundamentally a multi-touch point uh, industry, right? If you're traveling, there's air, there's hotel, there's car, there's uh, then card issuers who have loyalty programs tied to these travel programs. But th that industry has long you know, had a, 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 a huge amount of friction with this type of collaboration. There was an there's anti-competitive concerns, and there's privacy and regulation concerns. Uh, and so historically, you'd go to some of these travel uh, channels, and you could see you know, 20, 30 pixels because they were trying to make it work this way. Now there is a future-proofed way for these types of companies to be able to come in and again, connect to their data at source and be very, very intentional about what is and is not allowed from both a legal, privacy, and governance perspective. Financial services is another great example, right? Imagine you know, uh, being able to solve fraud detection or anti-money laundering. That involves multiple banks coming together and commingling their data. Now, banks are also competitive with each other, let alone all of the regulation and uh, the, you know, the, the legal rules that they have to follow. And so uh, this is a perfect example where clean rooms are unlocking use cases that have been blocked for, for, you know, for decades. The media and advertising industry, listen, this industry, uh, I've been in it fr from the beginning of its, of its uh, digital infancy in the late, late 1990s. And that industry has, been, uh, has thrived on being able to use data. And it is all done uh, historically by centralizing data. 
shipping ad log, shipping uh, user lists, adding pixels. And so that industry is frankly getting reinvented before our very eyes, moving all activity using data for planning, for optimization, for activation and measurement into the clean room. And the list goes on. So now lo love to have Anil show us a little bit of what this looks like in action. So this is uh, the Habu console. So this is what a client would be mostly looking at. You can uh, go back into some of the slides and uh, finish up with it. Yeah. Perfect. And so, um, so that last example is, takes us to uh, one of our customers who, who went on this exact journey, right? Which is they, they are a CPG company um, who you know, has access to data, but ultimately the, the most important data they have is coming from their retail partners who are selling their products. Uh, and so they fit in the category of that third bucket of going on offense. They certainly you know, started by saying, hey, there's some advertising use cases. We used to do it this way. Now we can't anymore, so we have to do it a different way. And then they said, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. We've, we've been asking people for data for years now, and the answer has always been no because, and now we can call them back up and turn those no's into yeses. And so here they started with us doing some pretty um, basic SQL-driven BI types use, use cases, really fundamentally answering the question, what's what, what's happening, right? And at some point it wasn't long before they started seeing some curves, some dips, some trends, and they said, I wanna do something about this. And the data science team came in and said, well, I bet we can build a model. I bet we can invent new science with access to this data. And frankly, that's what pushed us to develop the, the ML capabilities, which we're, we're so fortunate to be partnering with data, Databricks now, the, the leading data science platform in the, in the world, to be able to do this stuff without having to actually share the raw underlying assets. And they are now using this um, across merchandising, across pricing, across distribution. And so um, this is, this is a, a great example of where every single analytic, as we all know, always leads to the next analytic, leads to the next analytic, and, uh, and, and it's, it's a great journey to see. And so takeaways we want to make sure you, you leave with, I'll, I'll uh, reiterate the one I stressed earlier, which is, you know, go out, go back to your teams and think about what is that data set that you've long wanted access to and haven't been able to because legal said no or, or business says no and call them back and say, hey, we can do it because we have all these guarantees and protections in place. The second one and the reason why those are going to turn into a, a, for those no's and the yeses is you can do this with full control over privacy and governance, right? You can say exactly this can happen and nothing else. And for, uh, you can run any analytical workload, right? So just don't be concerned with just you have SQL or Python, you can use anything that you want. We'll help you build it. Um, and, and the fourth point, which is basically Databricks and Habu integration is live. It's now accessible. Um, I'll go to Perfect. If you, if you want to learn more, you can go to, uh, go to our website. We're, we're live in the Databricks marketplace. You can reach out to your, your, your Databricks uh, account team, uh, and we'd love to hear from you. And all that. That brings us to time. Um, I'm sure Anil and Matt are available for a few questions afterwards so you can go to them. Uh, but thank you once again, Anil and Matt. Great presentation. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.